Brilliance, Cherry, Neo. If you're not into cars, you may have a hard time recognizing these are Chinese brands. That's why Bike decided to name one of its brands simply Beijing. And this is the Beijing 5 or the X55. Now, usually I reveal the price of the car at the end of the episode, but this one here costs less than 30,000 euro. Do I have your attention now? Bike is a short for Beijing Automotive Group, and Bike Motor is responsible for the Beijing brand. Bike is a Chinese state-owned company whose technology partners include Mercedes-Benz and Hyundai. Also, Bike has a nearly 10% stake in Daimler. And now, what exactly is the Beijing 5? Beijing 5 is also known as the Bike Beijing X55 II and Senova X55. Yes, it would have been easier if they opted for just one name, but maybe it makes sense in China. Anyway, I'll call it Beijing 5 and it is roughly the size of a Toyota RAV4 and, at least in Poland, it comes in one trim level only. As standard, the Beijing 5 has so much kit that a comparably spec Toyota RAV4 costs an Igo X more than the Beijing. Now, of course, there is a catch, or maybe even 22 of them. The design is modern. There is the Beijing name on the rather simple bonnet. I guess Chinese logos are as obscure to us as the Skoda badges in India, for example. I like the high-positioned daytime running lights. The headlights are those smaller units in the middle of the bumper. I like the diamonds running across the middle, the air intake is at the very bottom, that's also where one of the driver assistance system sensors is located. The profile is simple and smooth, even the door handles are concealed. The black roof and the contrasting chrome window line make the car visually lower and so does the plastic cladding around the bottom and the wheel arches. The ground clearance is 16 cm. At the rear, the large Beijing sign is on a black background and it's clearly visible between the lamps, the diamond motif from the front bumper and the boomerangs from the front daytime running lights are repeated on the lamps. And I like that the design is coherent. I'd just skip the Baik sign and the 5 looks like an S, so it's all a bit confusing. Also, I don't understand why bother with dual exhaust when both tips are hidden under the bumper. And since I was looking under the car, it seems the undercarriage is rust protected. I also asked the bike about anti-corrosion protection and I was told the car undergoes e-coating, which is a process at the production stage before the car is painted. There's a proximity sensor, which I turned off. You can also open the boot using the remote control. The tailgate opens and closes about seven seconds, which is not as long as in a Toyota RAV4, but not as fast as in any Volkswagen. Now, according to the manufacturer, the boot capacity is just 350 liters, but according to my measurements, it's about 400 liters above the floor. There is also additional storage in the styrofoam insert below the floor and underneath the insert we get a mini spare. So I guess if Volkswagen was measuring this boot like it does in its Tiguan, it would probably come out to be at least 650 liters. There are shopping bag hooks and the tonneau cover fits under the floor. There are deep pockets on the sides so you can store something like windshield washer fluid and it won't be flying about the boot. Before we go inside, indulge my rant about door handles. Regardless of the car brand, I think retractable door handles are the work of Satan. They create problems, or rather more problems, than they solve. Regardless of fractions of CO2 saved, thanks to better aerodynamics, in case of an accident, I'd rather have the rescue services be able to grab a proper door handle rather than roll the dice on whether these will 
top out or not. Never mind everyday usability because proximity sensors solve the problem to an extent. However, when I'm inside the car with the key and the door handles are retracted, I have to act to extend them for the person approaching the vehicle. Okay, run over, bring back the normal door handles, please. At least the doors cover the sills, which I really appreciate in this weather. There's good legroom in the back. And thanks to rather reclined backrest, also headroom is generous. Now, I wouldn't mind if the tilt angle was adjustable even at the expense of headroom but for 30,000 euro I'll just survive with whatever we have here. The floor is completely flat so the middle passenger is better off than in many other cars. There are air vents and only one USB port and it's still a USB-A and why bother with this rubber cover business? Now there are pockets in the backs of the front seats. There is an armrest with cup holders. Isofix anchor points are on the side seats but the seats in the back aren't heated like you would get on higher spec Hyundai's and Kia's. Also, the door pockets are rather tight. And so are these cup holders. The Beijing 5 cockpit seems modern. There are displays in front of the driver and in the middle of the cockpit. Both are slightly above 10 inches across. The steering wheel has a Tesla vibe and there are very few buttons around the cockpit. Very few, but there are some. It's not a Tesla after all. Starting from the left, we have traditional window operating switches as well as mirror adjustment on the door. Over the driver's left knee is a toggle to control the headlight level. There are some buttons and toggles on the steering wheel to control the driver's display, the phone and the media. Behind the steering wheel are stocks for lights, indicators, wipers and cruise control. You'll recognize them from older Mercedes models. A start button on the dashboard, gear selector and parking brake on the center console and a hazard light switch on the ceiling next to the panoramic roof switches. According to information on the bike website, the panoramic roof is rain sensitive and it will close automatically. However, since during my test drive it was raining and snowing most of the time, I wasn't able to verify if the sensors actually work. The glove box opens normally with a button. Everything else is operated from the touch screen from the central display. Now the good thing is that there may be a software update sometime in the future. The bad news is it is unclear if and when the software updates may be released. And it's not even about not being able to find the uh, temperature menu climate control thingy especially when the car is moving and I don't care that the blind spot monitoring assist is actually in the camera settings for the parking menu options and stuff rather than with driver rights that's not a problem I'm more concerned that there is no Apple CarPlay and Android Auto and it is unclear if and when they will be added instead I can download a Chinese screen mirroring app I downloaded it to my backup phone, which is not connected to my regular Google account. However, it turned out my device isn't powerful enough to be able to mirror Google Maps on the car screen, and then it stopped working altogether. As far as usability is concerned, I'm prepared to find stuff where you may not be expecting it. For example, the seat memory settings are on a pull-down menu, along with Wi-Fi and screen settings. And quite often, some things get lost in translation. There are two phone cubbies on the center console, including one with wireless charger. The cup holders are rather tight, so are the door pockets. Under the armrest is some deep storage and it is ventilated, which, well, I don't need at the moment. Uh, there is also a USB-A port and a 12 volt outlet as well. Under the console is some more space and a USB-A port for data transfer if you want to risk using CarbitLink. Next to the glove box is a small hook, should you wish to secure your purse or something like that. The glove box is average size. The interior seems quite well put together, it doesn't squeak or rattle, there are a lot of soft touch surfaces and not much piano black. The seats with integrated headrests are comfortable, there is even lumbar support adjustment. However, I suggest taller drivers pay attention to how far the seat slides back, not very far, and the seat itself can be a bit too short 
if you are taller than 175 centimeters like yours truly. The Beijing 5 is propelled by a turbocharged 1.5-liter four-cylinder petrol engine outputting 177 horsepower and 305 newton meters of torque. It's a bike motor powertrain's own design. According to the manufacturer, combined fuel consumption should be around 7.2 liters per 100 kilometers. I suppose it's achievable in the summer, but as I'm reviewing this car in the winter in sub-zero temperatures, fuel consumption is in the high nines, low tens, and that's to be expected. Bike also promises 0 to 100 km per hour time of 7.8 seconds. Again, it was cold and wet and the wheels were slipping. So in comfort and sport mode, the best I got was 9 seconds. I think 7.8 seconds in the dry is possible. The Beijing 5 is front-wheel drive only and the 7-speed double-clutch transmission can be a bit jerky when taking off, even very gently. At speed, it's smooth. Or maybe that jerk is something that European car makers killed with software to lower emissions? Again, I'll blame it on low temperature, but as far as I can tell, the Beijing 5 doesn't have stop and start system. The engine has that pleasant mid-range grunt which helps you move along in dense traffic. It's only when you get to higher speeds and higher revs that the 1.5 liter unit is out of breath and I expected this as well. Also, forget driving fast actually because above 100 km per hour it gets loud inside, although at 140 km per hour the engine is at just 2.5 thousand RPM in 7th gear and the engine bay seems to be well soundproofed the windshield and the side windows are rather thin and this is how the wind noise gets into the cabin. Other than this, the crossover is pleasant to drive, the steering is light, a bit too slow for my liking, but then this is a city car. The suspension absorbs bumps with a pleasant thump. There are no unpleasant sounds or vibrations going into the cabin. The brakes could bite a bit earlier, a bit higher, but it's something you can get used to. And what about driver aids? Mm, well, here's a catch bigger than the infotainment system. Bike boasts this car comes equipped as standard with things like adaptive cruise control, 360 camera, uh, park assist, blind spot monitoring, lane departure warning including emergency assist feature and lane keeping assist. And you get all of this and many other assist features, but they all work like in a 10-year-old Hyundai, which is possibly where bike got the tech from. I tried various modes and various sensitivity settings. I tried motorways and regular roads. Lane keeping assist intervenes abruptly and keeps correcting my line. Or when the indicator turns off during changing lanes, the car wants to return to the original lane, even though I'm 80% in the new lane. Hmm, but there is more. I found blind spot monitoring in the park assist menu. It's not in the car user manual. So it leads me to believe it was added at the last moment to cars destined for Europe. It emits an audible warning every time there's a car in your blind spot. So pretty much all the time on the motorway. It doesn't matter. You're not changing lanes. It just keeps beeping at you. Interestingly enough, Beijing somehow managed to homologate its cars in Europe without traffic sign recognition, so there is no intelligent speed assist, the beeping thing. I'm not complaining. Another silver lining is the fact that since all driver assist features are annoying in this car, you can turn them off permanently. They will not come back on when you restart the car like in most other European cars. So that's a plus. And last but not least, automatic parking. At first, it seems pretty advanced. You can choose parallel, perpendicular or 45 degrees parking, front and back, and you can even indicate the exact spot where you want the car to park. And all this in a 30,000 euro car. Hmm, yes, about that. An ordinary parking maneuver takes so long, you have time to go get driving lessons and learn how to park. But there's more. 
Beijing 5 doesn't have side parking sensors, so if you start the maneuver next to an obstacle or an obstacle appears during the maneuver, the car won't see it. So it's up to you to stop the maneuver and prevent the collision. And just to be sure, there is a warning on the screen that says the driver is responsible for controlling the vehicle, yada yada yada. The only good thing is a 360 camera, which you're unlikely to find in any car at this price level. Which takes us back to the price. If you spec a similar crossover like the Beijing 5, you're looking at a 45 50,000 euro vehicle. But when you realize Beijing 5 has crappy driver assist systems, poor soundproofing and infotainment without Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, the price difference is not as overwhelming. That being said, good luck finding ventilated seats in this segment. Beijing 5 has them, but for 30 grand, there's always going to be compromise. On paper, the Beijing 5 offers features which you won't find on cars twice its price, but perhaps the low price is why some of these features won't work as one would want them to. On the other hand, these days you won't find a car this size for 30,000 euro, except maybe for other Chinese brands which are taking Europe by storm while they still can. Also, for some people, being able to just turn off all the driver aids may be an attractive proposition. And what do you think about the Beijing 5 and about the Chinese car revolution in Europe? Let me know in a comment section below. If you like my sarcastic, down-to-earth and possibly mildly amusing car reviews, join me every Friday at 3 p.m. Central European time. And don't forget to subscribe and like this video as it helps me with the YouTube algorithm. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next one.